All right, welcome to this episode of Market Shares. I'm your host, Tony Blodgett, and today I have the great privilege of having a, a conversation, interview, if you will, with my friend Amit Baruk. Amit, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tony. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Yeah, no, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Uh, Amit and I have known each other for um, for a little while, maybe a year, yeah. a little over a year, and um, have the great opportunity to work together now, But uh, which I'm super fortunate for. But you have a, a really interesting background, and I remember when we were first introduced, um, we both have a, a background in martial arts, and right, so it was like, right. you guys should probably get along really well because you have a martial arts background, but I think they're very different styles, and, and we've utilized them differently in our business. So. We're gonna get into that in a minute. We're gonna we're gonna save to the that. martial okay. arts story no for worries. for a minute because I want you to talk about how you've uh, how you've used that, what it's meant to you. Um, but I love to just get to know people and how they have found this mortgage industry. You know, um, we the the story is always interesting. I find, and it's a little bit different for everybody. And none of us really intended to end up in mortgage banking. So maybe if you could just give a quick background on yourself and how you found yourself into the mortgage industry. Wow, that's a great question, and, and you're right. I don't think anybody plans to go into mortgage banking. It's just not one of those career paths that they put out in uh, your college or your high school. I wish they did, Yeah, it's a great <laughs> industry, and I wish I'd started earlier, but uh, I did this out of necessity. I moved up here in uh, nine, 1999, November of 99. My family had a real estate business. My stepdad was a land developer. He also had huge risk tolerance and he invested in a high-tech company in Issaquah, Washington that had nothing to do with any of our business. And so I moved up here for that purpose. And uh, the internet bubble burst in early part of 2000, and I found myself without a job and in this beautiful Northwest. I had no idea what I was doing. I took a year off just to kind of learn my way around, meet some people, do some skiing, have some beautiful times in the Northwest. And then I found myself broke. Like literally, I was calling up Visa to ask if they accepted American Express as payment. So I mean, we got to a point. <laughs> Do where they? I, I don't know. Apparently, they don't. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, at okay. least they didn't at that time. <laughs> Times may change, but I realized they're like, okay, it's time to get back to work. And so I thought about what do I know how to do? And one of the things that I'd learned working with my stepdad in his land development company was how to finance real estate. There was no barrier to entry at the time. It was a pretty short runway to get your first deals. Um, Alan Greenspan had started to bring inflation down, which meant that inter, uh, the interest rates were starting to come down. Huge refi boom was in process. And so I just called 25 different companies that my wife, who was at my girlfriend at the time, found on uh, the Seattle Times real estate page, called them all up and said, hey, I'm looking for work. And that's how I got started. That was October of 2001. 2001, I was going to ask you. Yeah. Okay, well, it, yeah, so you had a good run since then. I mean, rates oh, even got absolutely. lower than that, right? Yes. 2003 was a fantastic year. It for was incredible. Well, and, yeah, there, there was no training at the time. There was, like, my sales manager <laughs> handed me a phone and the white pages and said, here are your leads. Interest rates are good. Call everyone. When you have someone interested, I'll show you how to do a, an application. And that was it. Yeah, well, I love hearing stories about people who got in during those times when there was no training. That's I got in in the in the late '90s, and it was the same thing. But you know, the good news about not having any training is we had to go learn for ourselves, and you learn uh, how to make a lot of calls and get a lot of rejection right. before you, you you figure it out. And what I've learned is is that people who kind of cut their teeth in, in the streets, <laughs> getting their teeth kicked in. Um, they tend to survive every cycle because you, you know you can always revert back to those days when you knew nothing. At least now you you know something, you know the business, and all you have to do is go out and put in that same amount of work that you did back then, and and you know the results are going to be there. So, um, well, I, I love hearing that story. Yeah. Um, you know, now you've really made a, a shift in your business to working purchase business um, primarily and working with. Um, you know, you work on the east side, where down where you live. I mean, you have a hot lot of uh, you know tech borrowers, and and the you've moved into the kind of the high end side of our industry. Talk a little bit about that evolution. How did you go from being a, a refinance loan officer into more purchase focused, and how have you built the business with the real estate community in order to get the um, the referrals that you get today? Absolutely. Uh, it, it's a it's a long story that I'll condense really quickly. The brokerage I was working for at the time got bought by Countrywide Home Loans hmm. in 2005. 
in 2008 countrywide collapsed when the rest of the market collapsed and along with it uh, Bank of America acquired Countrywide and I was part of that acquisition as was my the entire company I worked for um, and there was no loans for anybody and it took a long time for me to, to decide if I really wanted to stay in this industry to be honest with you I came out of that in 2012 ish 2013 and I decided that yes I really want to be a mortgage loan officer this was going to be it for me but I had to rebuild my business because I lost everything during that time at Bank of America. So rather than focus on refis, I knew that the lifeblood of this business, that anything that I was going to do for perpetuity had to be with purchasers. So I focused on getting back in front of real estate brokers, one broker at a time, one call at a time, lots of rejection, lots of people saying, no, I already got somebody. Uh, maybe I'll make you my third or my fourth or my whatever. But I answered the phones at, at night, I answered the phones on weekends, and I was that one person that they could count on when they needed. So that really helped. The other thing that helped was a clock hour class that I created to teach real estate brokers how to do their job more safely. And that was something that was a unique and still is a unique offer. Um, it's put me in front of thousands of real estate brokers over the years, and I still do a lot of business with those people. Well, let's 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 unpack that story a little bit because this I love this about your um, about your business, but it all starts with martial arts, right? right. You're a practitioner of Krav Maga. That's correct. Can you give us a little bit of background on what that is, how you got introduced to um, that style of martial arts, and how long you've been uh, training and practicing? Sure, sure. Uh, Krav Maga is the Israeli military hand-to-hand -hand combat system. It's a very fancy way of saying that we teach people how to slam other people's heads into walls. <laughs> Perfect. It's really straightforward. <laughs> There's not a lot of art to it, but... It's something that I learned many years ago. Uh, before I got into all of this work, I worked for the Israeli government in, in Houston. And that's where I got trained. That's where I did a lot of my, uh, cut my teeth, so to speak. And so I've been doing that for 30 years, give or take. So when you were working for the government back then, did you do training as well? And you just kind of adapted that into? Yeah, I, I was trained by the security detail to be part of that security detail. Got it. So I got all of that basic stuff kind of worked into my psyche. And then over the years, when I came up here, especially I found another Krav Maga school, I got certified as an instructor. So I do teach on Thursday nights, I teach civilians, I also teach law enforcement officers, bodyguard teams, all sorts of interesting people. And through all that time, I, it became apparent to me that real estate brokers meet unknown people in vacant homes. Oh yeah. Like that's their job. And the criminals call that crime by appointment. So there's a whole layer of risk that, that real estate brokers face. Uh, and we want to balance their safety and their sales, right? I don't want them to be so worried about selling or about safety that the two don't meet. So I found a way to teach them how to do their jobs while presenting what I refer to as a deterrent and avoidance perspective. And that's, I got that certified for three hours of clock hour credit. So I teach that, they get continuing education credit. It's a really fun class. Not a lot of physical contact in that class. I okay. would prefer that I was they wondering. don't fight, Okay. right? I mean, the best fight is the one you don't have. That's right. Uh, but I do show them some things, I do teach them stuff. And then I do a second class where I teach them how to do with the physical things if they want that. Got it. And it's been wildly successful. So the very first class that you did, was it already clock hour certified or were you teaching classes and then decided you would you would get it certified so more people would be interested or tell me about that. Yeah, no, the first one was a dry run. I was actually hoping to, to do other things with it. And I thought, well, before I invest in video work or other things like that, maybe I should teach the class live a couple of times and get my chops, get my my spiel down a little bit better. So I, I scheduled a class. Uh, it was at the Prudential Real Estate Office in Bellevue. Prudential doesn't even exist any longer, right? It right. was bought by Berkshire Hathaway. This would have been, I want to say 2012. Okay. And um, I had a room of 30 real estate brokers and they were fascinated by what I had to share. And I thought, this has legs. I got to get this certified. I got to find a way to make it so that because real estate brokers are busy. They don't have time to just hang around for three hours and learn something, even if it's life saving. So they need those clock hours. And so I went through, found a way to get myself certified as a clock hour instructor, get the class certified. Then I I linked up with the Realtor Association out of King County and they host the school. You need three different components to get certified. It's doable, but it took a little bit of work. And then once I 
got that certified, I started really marketing the class and saying, hey, three hours of credit, you're going to learn something new. It's going to be different than you've, anything you've experienced. Why don't you give it a shot? And it's been really successful. Yeah, so 10 years of doing that. That's yes. that's very cool. I Now, I, I envisioned that there would be more physical contact in this class. Right. But when we were speaking before about this, you kind of shared with me, and I don't want to go too much into it because you, you got to take the class to learn this, but you talk a lot about like situational awareness. You talk about looking around the, the, the neighborhood, the cars that are parked. I mean, right? Is that right. a big part of it? Yeah. Absolutely. And that's the case, whether you're selling real estate or going to the movies or going out on the town with your significant other, like you've got to be aware of what's going on around you. You've got to be, have your eyes open. You got to get out of your cell phone. That's our biggest problem, right? We're all like this staring yeah. at our cell phone. we got those AirPods in, you can't hear very well. And so we just don't know what's happening around us. And that's one of the easiest things to teach and the hardest things to implement. Yeah. Like I would much rather see trouble coming and walk away before trouble is on me, now I got to fight my way out of it. That's a real problem. Yeah. But you have to be prepared for that. And most of us are just too distracted. Yeah. Well, I thought it's fascinating and I never really thought of it that way. And I could see where, uh, and I do know uh, actually a pretty good friend of mine was assaulted at, um, at uh, open house. Yeah. Um, pretty badly actually. And luckily, you know, he, he was, a, you know, a, a very fit, you know, large man that knew how to, you know, take care of himself right. and was able to fight off his offenders and get out of the house. But gosh, I mean, really being aware and keeping those things from happening in the first place, you know, for a lot of people, I, I know a lot of realtors who won't even go to an open house by themselves or, right. you know, so there's definitely a need for this training. So I, I commend you. I don't see this a lot in the real estate space. So I think you got a little bit of a niche there and it looks I, like it's working for I you. I do. And I appreciate that. And I will tell you that the average real estate broker, it happens to be a woman, typically later on in life in their late forties, early fifties, those people should not be fighting. Right. Right. I mean, fighting for survival is, is a horrible thing. And we have to do whatever we can to avoid that, to just create a situation where they're not going to be in that position in the first place. Real estate's a great uh, great industry. You know this. Oh, yeah. You can make a lot of money. You can help a lot of people. You can do hours that, you know, your own hours, but there's some risk inherent to that. And so I would advise anybody to find a niche of something that they really love that may have a crossover to the real estate industry and help create a class or create some information for people. Because what we know, like, I know this stuff. I live this stuff. I breathe this stuff. I'm sure you're really good at the art that you practice, but not everybody knows that. Yeah. And people don't know how to implement those things. And we can really help people and we can create relationships for ourselves with referral partners that way. Absolutely. Well, I know a lot of people who've, you know, done clock hour classes as a, as a way of uh, presenting value to both the real estate community, but also meeting, you know, realtors with the, with the goal of getting business. But I, I, I've never met someone who does a class like that. So let's, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, so, Starting off in your career, mostly during a refinance market and then making that transition, you talk a little about that. What is, what is something that you know now that you wish you would have known when you first got in this industry? The value of a CRM okay. is worth its weight in gold. The cost of finding new clients as opposed to recycling clients for whom you've done great work for in the past that is a huge game changer. If you can find a way to reach out to your clients time and again and create those relationships and be there for them when they have their next baby or what have you, and all of a sudden they need more real estate because their family's growing, their kids are getting bigger, that three bedroom, one bathroom house is no longer gonna accommodate the four kids that they've got. That is a huge way, not just to make business for yourself, but also for your referral partners who may not be aware of that either. Real estate brokers are so busy, man. When they're out, they're out, right? Yep. They're not multitasking. They're showing property and that's all they can do. So the least you can do for your partners is send them an email saying, hey, Tom and Becky are pregnant again. They got another one coming in six months. You may want to reach out to them. Their real estate needs may be changing. And the only way you're going to know that is if you keep in contact with people and have a good CRM that you can revisit 
for your notes. Well, and I think it's valuable to the client themselves. You know, unfortunately, a lot of people forget who their mortgage person was. They may have loved you and thought you did a great job. You already know their 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 life story and, and all their stuff, but then they but then they forget who you are. So if you're able to maintain a great database, stay in touch with them, reach out to them proactively during those times. Right. You know, I was having a conversation uh, just last week with with a gentleman and he said, you know, the tough thing about mortgage is that people only transact like, you know, once every 10 years in some cases, right? They have, you know, these long spans of time in between, unlike, you know, like if you're selling a product like an iPhone, like some people are on their iPhone every day, they're getting a new one every couple of years. And I reminded him, I said, you know, there's more reason than ever, in my opinion, to reach out to your client. I'm a big fan of an annual review. I've talked about that on the podcast here, and that's a part of maintaining your database is checking in with people on a regular basis. And a lot of people would say to me, well, Tony, I just gave them an interest rate in the low threes. You know, why would they possibly want to hear from me? And um, and I could rattle off, like, I mean, maybe, maybe they're getting married. Maybe they're getting divorced. Maybe they're having a kid. Maybe they got a kid going to college. Maybe they're out of work for six months, and they have a bunch of debt, and now they're back to work, and they could consolidate their debt and lower their payment. I mean, I could list off a number of things why people might need to have a conversation with their mortgage advisor, even if it's not during the time when they're purchasing a new home. And so that's great advice. If you don't have a database, I talked about this on one of our very last episodes was maintaining a database, even if it's outside of the company that you work for. We worked together to make sure that your database was able to be easily synced up with uh, with our technology so that you can maintain uh, your book of business, your clients outside of what it is that we do here. You use Jungo. That's correct. correct? Yep. So Jungo is a, a mortgage-specific database that's uh, that's on the Salesforce platform. That's it's right. A, it's a good option. A lot of top producers use that. Uh, it's not the only one out there, but I agree with you, Amit. Uh, find a database and don't just put names in there. Like, you know, when people say, these are my clients, well, they're not your clients if they never hear from you. Right, so right. <laughs> you got to reach out once in a while. Absolutely. I, I'm a fan of relationship building. I really believe that these are people that trust us for the biggest transactions in their life, meaningful transactions, things that are life changing, are life affirming. And we should be in their lives. Now, that doesn't mean I'm expected to be invited to all their birthday parties and all the rest of that stuff, but I like to send them a, a quick little video for their birthday. That CRM pops up every week. I've got a list of who's got a birthday coming up. I spend 10 minutes recording a little, a little video, not in this kind of studio, although you could, but you get your phone out there, you send it to them on their birthday. It's just a little check-in. Every one of these things adds to your value, adds to your relationship. And I would much rather go deep with clients rather than have to go and find new clients every single time, win their trust, win their business, establish that relationship. We already have that. Why would I want to let that go? Yeah, no, 100%. Well, that's great advice. So if you don't have a CRM, get a CRM. The last thing I want to talk about with you, Amit, is, you know, obviously I'm a big fan of doing video, doing, you know, I, I'm, I'm really enjoying doing this podcast and getting good feedback uh, about it. Um, but I also, part of market shares is doing market updates and what's going on in the market. So you, uh, and I've been watching your video well before you, you worked here, but you do a video, what is it? Do you do every week? Every Thursday. Every yeah. Thursday. And, um, and it's not just like a, like a two minute video. Like you, you go deep. I, I ramble on as the song goes. Yes. This was a, a byproduct of COVID. Um, when COVID happened, I was not able to teach classes. I taught my last real estate self-defense class March 5th of 2020. Now it's, it's since picked up, but I, I went cold turkey and I like, I like performing. I like sharing information. I like being in front of people. And I thought, what am I supposed to do here? Like this entire world is changing. The markets are changing. People know nothing about what's going on really. Uh, and so I just decided to start what I call 30 minute Thursday and it's a half hour long it doesn't have to be but it usually ends up that way and it's just me and a tripod now we've got these cool studios so yeah I've upgraded well, I'm image, looking right? forward to, to seeing you in the Kirkland studio yeah. and, and I had one last week in the studio it was fantastic it's really comfortable space but the idea is really to talk to people about what's going on in the market what's going on with interest rates what's going on with uh, the economy what's going on with real estate in general and give them 
a, a bigger dose of information. And it works. It works to, to help me with video. I get a lot of people calling me up saying, hey, I saw your thing. I want to talk with you a little bit more about that. Yeah. Well, and even if you can't watch the full 30 minutes, right? Like sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll see it going or I'll, I'll try to catch it live or I'll, I'll see it on Facebook and, you know, watch a few minutes of it in, in between things. And, you know, you, you pick up a little nugget here and there and maybe you want to hear more. So I just got to ask you, I don't want to put you on the spot. So of your last few episodes, what are some larger things that have kind of bubbled up to the surface that you think are relevant, you know, kind of in this cycle that we're going through right now? Absolutely. Two huge things okay. from last week. Number one, the three, two, one buy down or the two, one buy down. Real estate brokers just do not even know that this exists. Mm. This is a real problem. And the problem is that it's hard to put that in the marketing remarks or the notes in their listings. So buyers agents, getting them informed about this opportunity because you're buying the payment. You're not buying the rate right now. We know the rates are going to change, right. but we got to get them into a comfortable payment and they don't even know that that exists. So it's frustrating. The other one is buyer approved. The, the BAP. Oh program. yeah. Buyer accepted. Yeah. Uh, buyer accepted. Excuse me. That is a huge program for people that may want to write a contingent offer. Like you've got a mm -hmm. listing yep. and a buyer comes to you and says, Hey, will the seller take an offer contingent on me selling my departing residence? Maybe, but maybe they don't need that. Maybe we could do a buyer accepted program for them. We buy the home through buyer accepted. They move in, then they sell their departing residence. It gets that property sold that much quicker for the listing. And people don't even realize I have a call scheduled tomorrow about that. Exactly. It's an older club, excuse me, an older couple. They want to buy a smaller home without stairs. They've got a ton of equity in their, their departing residence, but they don't want to move twice. Right. And so their, their brokers are saying, hey, can we do a bridge loan? Can we do a HELOC or whatever it is? Who knows? But buyer accepted can come in there if they qualify and take care of most of those problems for them and do a fast, easy transaction. And they're, they're there. Yeah. No, I love that. So the three, two, one, two, one buy down. We did an episode about that. I'm sure we can, I don't know what episode it is, but if you go back in the archives of market shares, there's a, there's a buy down episode and we may even do a more in depth one because I think you're right. I mean, conceptually we hear a lot of noise about it, but like the math behind it is kind of complicated, you it know, is. especially when you get the three, two, one. Now we're, now we're going three years into it. We're going right. pretty deep to begin with. And then you can couple those a lot of times with just an actual rate buy down as well. So you can do a permanent buy down with a, with a two, one or three, two, one. And, and, um, yeah, there's, there's lots of different ways of, uh, of carving that up. I love that. Okay. So last, as we round out here, you know, we're, um, we've seen interest rates go up a bit. That's an understatement. It, it's happening. Interest rates have gone up the most that they've ever gone up in history in this period of time. Um, inflation has not yet peaked. I think it may have peaked, but we don't know until, Next month, right? We'll find out, we'll, right? We'll find November out. 10th. We'll find out November 10th. Uh, is it the 10th or 11th? I, I believe it's the 10th. 10th. The 11th is Veterans Day. So, Ooh, you're right. So yes. maybe it's 10th. You're right. Okay, so 10th, around the 10th, we'll see if we have peak inflation. What's your prediction on inflation? Do you think we're going to round that corner? What do you think on interest rates? Do you think they're they're going to start coming down, or do you even want to put yourself out there? I always want to put myself out okay, there. I am it. a risk taker <laughs> on that. So I think that inflation will come down. Um, when is a whole other story. I think we've got a lot of other things that the economy's got to digest right now. Uh, but the good news is that they are trying to bring that rate of inflation down. They're taking it serious. Yeah. And that means that they're going to do some things. And that's when I got started in this industry 21 years ago. We were on the downward slope of an upward inflationary pressure that Alan Greenspan, the Fed chairman at that time, said, not on my watch, and started bringing that down. And so I've seen the power yep. of what can happen when that does start to happen. I don't know if it'll happen November or first quarter of 2023 or summer of 23, but I know that this is a huge segment of the economy, and they cannot let the real estate market languish like that. So they're going to bring inflation down one way or the other. And we should be preparing for that right now. We've yeah. got to sow those seeds right now so that we're ready to receive all that business when it comes our well, way. Well, back to your CRM, right? Exactly. I mean, that's, that, absolutely. I think every loan that we're doing today is probably a loan in the not too distant future. I personally believe that when we see the November um, CPI numbers, we will see inflation for the first time year over year inflation come down a little bit. Yep. That's, that's my, that's kind of my prediction. That's what I think is going to happen. Um, I think if that doesn't happen, well, I may have to put out an episode talking about why interest rates are at 9%. So I'm, I'm hoping that's not going to happen. I have a whole 
think that they're not going to nine. I'm, I'm, I'm convinced they're not going to nine. But, hey, we'll see. I've, I've been wrong before. But I, I do feel like, just looking at it, that inflation is going to hit that, that point. I don't think we see a huge drop in rates, though. I think that we see a drop in rates, but I don't think it's going to be significant. It'll be nothing like what we went through when COVID hit or some of the other major um, market disruptions that have happened. I think that we see a much slower drop in rates over time. Uh, I do think that the, this economy will have, you know, the intention of the Fed's raising rates is to yeah, bring down inflation by slowing the economy. That slowing of the economy will last well into next year, and it'll be interesting to see if we get to the point where we start seeing real um, you know, unemployment numbers going up because we have still really strong employment right now while we're still trying to fight inflation. I mean, it's a, it's, it's, it's a tough thing, and I think the, the Fed's going to have to do a lot of damage before all that you know, sinks in. And then when it does, it could get a little rough for a well, while. You're right, and I agree with you. At, at the risk of being a little bit negative, I agree. I think that there's unintended consequences. And I think that this is going to be a, a bigger and deeper fight. But here's the thing. The championship fights are always the hardest ones, right? The ones that win those fights are champions. And so I'm in this thing for the long haul. I'm not out to, to make a quick buck and disappear next year or next, you know, next two years. I'm here to do this because I love what I do. I believe in what we do. And I think that a lot of our competition is going to get soft. Yeah. They're, they're, they don't have the appetite for it. It's hard, man. It's really hard. I'm there. I get that. But what else are we going to do? Yeah. Right? So I want to dig into this thing. Whatever the rates are, people are still going to be buying homes. Whatever the rates are, people are still going to need to get a divorce or whatever and get off that mortgage and get a refi or whatever it is. Someone's going to get that business. Yep. It might as well be us. Absolutely. And so I don't give up on that stuff. Whatever the rates are, I, I learned I can't control that. Whatever their credit scores are, I can't control that either. All I can do is work with what we got. And I think that there's enough out there that we're going to be able to win. And that's all I look for. So if other people want to quit, hey, leave your CRM at the door. <laughs> I'll, call all those I'll call all those people for you and tell them that you're not there, but that I'm happy to pick it up for them. Yeah. No, that, that's great advice. I think we're going to end on that because it is – um, look, in 2021, there was over $4 trillion of mortgage originations. Next year, it's probably going to be $2 trillion. Right. Okay, $2 trillion is still a fantastic year. Man. That's a lot of business out there. And even if you look here in our local market, there's a lot of transactions happening. And to your point, we just have to go out and get ours and do it through hard work, teaching classes like what you're doing, reaching out to your CRM, staying in touch with your database. Amit, this has been an awesome conversation. My pleasure. It always goes by faster than I expect it to. But, uh, no, I'm, I'm glad you came on. You have a, a, a unique um, backstory. I, I love the, the way that you've gone about doing this business, and you've created a, a real good lane for yourself. And so I'm proud of you, man. Um, thanks for sharing your story. Thank you to our audience for tuning in to Market Shares. I'm sure everyone watching this has already liked and subscribed, right? I'm, they, I would hope so. I would, I hope, would so. hope so. But if, if you, you if you haven't in the in the in the in the crazy, you know, possibility that you haven't yet, why don't you please subscribe? So why that you wouldn't don't, you? Why wouldn't you? Right? I mean, it's so easy. And Click that button. And, and probably share it with other people in the industry. Everybody needs to learn everyone what's going on. It. Absolutely. All right, Amit, thank you. Till next time. Bye for now.